Good afternoon, everyone. Today I have with me Brad Buttrick of Hidden Harvest Grow Lighting. And as we move forward, we need to really start talking about solutions for the problem. You see the delayed planting going on right now in our fields across the northern hemisphere. This is a solution that we can use. Brad developed this all-in-one spectrum light as he was working at Sunshine Systems. Each panel only draws 36 watts, which means it's easily implementable if you have even the smallest of solar panels. And this full spectrum light will take you through seeding, sprouting, flowering, and fruiting of the plants. I feel this grow light system is something new and something innovative. So for those of you out there looking for solutions on how to grow, how to do indoor farming, how to grow microgreens, how to set up an indoor facility, vertical indoor facility, this will be part one of a four part series that we're doing together. And I really hope that this helps you make decisions to at least prepare and think about the way you're going to need to grow your own food moving forward into the intensifying grand solar minimum. Tell us a little bit about how you came up with the grow lights and why you think that this is going to work during this new grand solar minimum. Tell us about the project that you have going on. Uh, you have live feed to your grow racks there and also that you are bringing us through daily updates on how fast the plants are growing compared to traditional red and blue spectrum LED light strips. Well, when I started working at Sunshine Systems, it was a new technology at the time, not new to science, but new to growers. And it took off like wildfire, unfortunately. And I worked for the company for about three years, went to Chicago Flower Show and did consultation over the phone uh, with growers around the country and the world. And there was a lot of, I wouldn't say disappointment, but a lot of, a lot of more people expected better results out of this pure quote unquote science in this lighting. So after some time with the company and seeing some differences, I started ordering my own lighting uh, and putting different spectrums into it. And then I realized as the industry got bigger, uh, more LEDs were available. In the very beginning, white was a very difficult and expensive color to get. Within three years, the price had gone down. So I started mixing my own spectrums and ultimately I examined daylight from a, a non-scientific viewpoint. I just looked at what the normal day sunlight was broke it down into Kelvin temperatures, and then figured out what I wanted to use for ratios within a grow light. And it's a great grow light. I mean, I've worked with every single grow light in the market today, uh, LEDs, all different colors, with shave lengths and styles, uh, induction lighting, high pressure sodium, metal halide, T5s. Um, I've been through all of it. LEDs were supposed to be a solution for everyone in the beginning. And unfortunately, the red and blues, I think, should never really made it to market. It was more of a science fair project because it eliminated very important spectrums that, the, that plants use uh, for photosynthesis. So when I put the light together and get everything done, it violates all of the rules supposedly that grow lights follow. As far as you gotta keep it close to the light because of lack, uh, close to the plants because of lack of spectrums, uh, driving it with too much wattage to get the spectrum down to the plant. Um, and there's also a lot of uh, a lot of problems with the traditional because with traditional grow lighting because you lose 50 percent of your light in the reflection. It's a round bulb. It was just inefficient across the board, and the LEDs were were a solution. And I believe that the white full spectrum that I've designed is the best LED grow light out there today potentially because of what it offers to plants. I went through some crazy Kelvin ratios and figured out one that works, and it's apparent on uh, on all the grows that I've done. This light doesn't have any faults anywhere. It's actually better than average grow lights. Yeah, so when I was talking about the YouTube channel that you're running, you're showing daily updates and you also have links. What is the YouTube channel? Can you tell us a little more about that for others out there listening? I know, you know, right in the beginning of the show, a lot of people like to tune in because they don't have a full two hours. So I try to put the most bang for the buck in the first 15 to 20 minutes, you know, if you only have limited time. So the racks that you have and then how you're cataloging and putting this into sort of a, a database and you're keeping this for a repeatable uh, Salwishay project. So how can people find yep. this information that they can see with their eyes what you're talking about? Right. Well, the, the YouTube channel is Hit and Harvest on YouTube. 
I think it's the most important thing to concentrate on right now as far as taking care of folks when they get into a situation where traditional growing methods aren't available anymore. So basically what I'm doing right now is I'm proving the lights out on camera every two days so people can see the actual growth, what to expect from the lighting and how to use it. For the next two weeks, I'll be doing mostly just visual. Uh, I'll start getting into more instruction on how I do things, distances for the lights so that you get optimal growth and so forth. So when you talked about we're going to be needing this because we're not going to be able to grow outside, are you talking about total solar irradiance? And, you know, with the grand solar minimum coming, they're expecting a reduction of about five to six watts per square meter out of the total TSI that's, you know, striking our planet. And along with the volcanism, you know, there's going to be more cloud cover and the increasing galactic cosmic rays also creating a new cloud band and thickening the cloud band from 15,000 to 18,500 feet, which means albedo, less sunlight striking the surface of our planet. How do you think this, in your personal opinion, how do you think this would affect the plant growth compared to the amount of sun that you know we've seen in the 1990s, the year 2000, when the skies were relatively clear? That being said, what do you feel that the, uh, the TSI drop's gonna do to the plant harvest compared to bringing it in and I firmly believe we're going to have to shift our agriculture in many, many ways. So bringing it indoors is only going to be one facet of the whole diamond. There's probably 20 other things we need to get onto. But what do you feel about the, the growth that's going to be inhibited just by the decrease in TSI, the increase in uh, volcanism and the increase in cloud layers? I'm not a scientist like you and I have spoken about. I watch um, the same channels that you do. But from what I can understand is we really don't know what the sun's going to do, but we do know the magnetosphere is weakening. And according to another uh, program that we watched, there's a potential danger. We won't even be able to go outside if the magnetosphere keeps weakening the way it is. So if it's going to be dangerous to us, how is, how, I don't understand how plants are going to grow effectively, especially if there's more or one of you know, higher IR or UAA coming through, UV rather. Um, we just don't know what's going to happen to the plants. So, I mean, the greenhouse will be an option, but the grow line can still be used in the greenhouse. If we have limited sunshine and limited power from the sun, uh, these grow lights could be added into a greenhouse easily to extend daylight and uh, lengthen grow time and add more spectrum into the, into the greenhouse. Because I don't know what it'll do when, when the sun weakens anymore. I mean, I don't know who would know that. Um, I just know that by using poor grow lights, things don't grow well. You know, so if it, that sun's doing the same thing, maybe we won't get the same production from growing uh, despite the weather. Yeah, that's right. And you touched on an important point there, UVB uh, increasing. I mean, the UV rates right now, I watch Mr. BBB333, and he also uh, goes around weekly. People who have measurement or measuring just in their yards or wherever they might be in their local neighborhoods with the UV, everything even in the spring is already 11 and 12. It's ridiculous. I mean, when I was a kid, we wouldn't see that until maybe midsummer. And even at that point, it barely went above 10. And if it did in the news, they'd be like, put on sunscreen. It's going to be above 10. It's at nine something today. And now routinely, even in the spring, it's 11, 12. So, you know, I saw readings last year, 18, 21 in the summertime. Uh, so this increased UV and feel free to throw out some of the references of the channels you're watching, et cetera, just for people to get resource based. So they can also you know, take a look. And I believe everybody's smart enough out there. If we talk about channels or links to go to, it's your responsibility to look through the information and make your own choice, not us to feed you. And you just believe what we say. That's not the way it works. We're going to give you some information, but it's your choice as an informed individual to compare info and see if you feel it's true. If it's not true, do your own research and then come at it from that point. Don't believe the yep. spoon, spoon feeding. You got to do your own research on this. Well, and this is a very difficult time to bring truth to anyone with all the news situation going on, fake news and this flip flop of uh, of traditional MSM, you know, and it's very difficult to, for people to delineate the truth from from lies now. Nobody really knows. So you, you have to really be careful. Um, one of the things that I got a lot when I first got into this about four years ago, I, uh, I came in after watching a bunch of different YouTube channels like Ben from Suspicious Observers talks about. And, you know, I watched his video before I woke up, you know, and that really it reeled me in and listening to knowledge more than fear and in, or emotional uh, talk from people that were fear based thinking rather than knowledge based thinking. So that's why I try to stick the sites like I really like, uh, you know, DAP 2030, Suspicious Observers. 
uh, Ice Age Farmer, you know, Oppenheimer Ranch. Those are my four go-tos during the given day. Outside of that, I think it's all fluff. This is part one of four. I'm going to continue with the next episode next week where we get much deeper into the changes on our sun affecting agriculture on our planet. You can find all the links below in the description box, including links to Hidden Harvest YouTube channel with the video grow series, watching the progress of indoor farming, which you can do yourself.